just, um, just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's uh, presence there where you are this morning. Father, I thank you that we can all, all gather in the name of Jesus this morning. Thank you, Father, that we can even through Zoom connect with one another. And Lord, thank you as that last song said this morning that your Holy Spirit is here. And that your Spirit is ministering to us. And you're touching our lives. And Lord, thank you as we, we go through your word that you will have your way. That you will be glorified. Your name will be exalted. In Jesus' name. I just had a picture um, while we were worshipping of someone sitting in a room. Um, and it looked like, you know, there was an element of darkness that was just over your life. Um, uh, I guess because of worry, difficulty. Uh, and I just heard the Lord saying that I see you. That I know where you are. I know your fears. I know your concerns. I know everything about you. And I invite you to give those things to me. I just believe you need to just this morning, just trust God and hand over those, those fears, those concerns, and just give it to him. And what the, the scripture that came to mind was Psalms uh, 23. And um, we, the Lord is actually saying that I have already prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies, a feast table where you can sit and dine with him. And then he says that I have anointed your head with oil, with favor. You are in my presence. Even in the old days, um, the, she the, the shepherds used to, used to, to uh, oil the sheep's head to protect them from their flies and all that stuff. And in the same way, God is anointing your head with oil to protect you from the onslaughts of the enemy. But you need to come to him. You need to come sit at that table which he has prepared for you this morning. Scripture says that we must cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And I want to invite you this morning just to cast your cares on Jesus and allow him to minister to you. Give those things. You do not have to sit in darkness. You do not have to sit in fear because he is for you. So I pray that God will deliver you this morning, that you will hand over those things and that you will see and experience his presence this morning in Jesus' name. And Loretta, if you can just share that word for us quickly. Just in worship um, on Monday, um, I just had a picture of fresh green grass growing up out of the ground, um, seed growing, sprouting new life. And she just felt that hearts are being awakened to life as we pray for the lost. Um, so maybe this morning we can just take a moment to pray for those around us that still need to meet Jesus. I mean, so what I, I'm going to suggest is as we go through the service that you will, you know, just allow the Holy Spirit to lay some people on your heart that you need to pray for. You know, maybe it's your neighbors, maybe it's family, maybe it's a, a colleague at work, um, that you will just trust God so that you can just pray for them, especially in the ministry time at the end of the service. So um, just to have a pen and paper there ready and to, to write down those names that you want to pray for. Yeah, amen. So, yeah, so, so this morning we're kicking off this sermon series on Philippians. Um, I don't know who of you maybe thought of reading through Philippians uh, this week, but Philippians to me is, is, is a great book. And I, I won't say it's my favorite. It's Laurette's favorite, one of Laurette's favorites. I think my favorite um, it's possibly James, um, but uh, you know, as I was preparing, and even um, last week, God just started speaking to me uh, about uh, Philippians, and especially this theme around sold out, uh, being sold out. You know, I don't know about you, but um, when I was born again, there was a few buzzwords at that time, um, and I remember, and as, as I was even recalling, um, you know, when I prepared was. I think some of the words that were, were going around was radically saved. Um, you know, uh, Coleman made that quite big. Uh, addicted to Jesus was quite uh, popular at the time, obviously because of Coleman as well. Uh, and uh, he sang that song, Addicted to Jesus. I actually thought of just playing it before <laughs> the service. But uh, such a, such, 
you know, a few of these things, and even sold out, being sold out for God, was things that were, when I got, gave my life to Christ, were, <clears throat> as I thought back, things that was quite radical and powerful at that time. And when I think about sold out, I think of that, that scenario where, you know, there is no more, there's nothing left. You know, when you, when you desire that thing, you cannot get it because it's completely sold out. Uh, for any woman going shopping, you know, especially if there was a special on that's your worst nightmare is that you get there and it's sold out and you can't get it at that good price. So I believe as we look at Philippians, um, that for me, that is partly, you know, there's a joy theme that you see in Philippians that comes through quite strongly. But there's this theme about being sold out. You know, if we look at Paul's life, um, we see that that he was sold out for God. If, if you read his writings, then there's so many times that he has that slant to his message that he gives. And we're going to look at that this morning. But maybe before we get in, just, just some background, uh, um, you know, a bit of overview for, for Philippians. So the church in Philippi was uh, birthed. In Acts 16, 12 to 40, where Lydia came to Christ and then her whole family actually got saved through that process. And that is, was how this church started. And the amazing thing about this church was that um, they had quite a missional um, inclination. From the start go, they were very involved with Paul's missionary experience and they supported him um, Quite a bit, and even if you if you start reading chapter one, um, you'll see how he he celebrates and he thinks about them. Sorry, my Bible's on this side, so I just want to refer to it every now and then. But how he he, he looks at them and he and he says, "I thank God when I think about you, you know, and even your involvement in my ministry." So for him, obviously, um, this is a very special group of people. This is also the the one book that he wrote that he doesn't start off with his credentials. That is a apostle that he feels he needs to establish his authority before he speaks to these people. It's almost like with the Philippians, he has this, this different relationship, this love relationship, which he didn't necessarily have with the other churches. You know, where he could almost be himself as he was writing to them at the time. Um, quite an encouraging way, if you, if you read it, if you see how he speaks to them, um, you know, he, he was obviously in love uh, with him at the time, you know, they were very special to him. So you're welcome to just take some time and, and read to it. But I want to pick up basically on five things that Paul writes in this letter. And I'm going to conclude with that at the end. But there's five sort of main themes that he addresses for me in this book that, you know, obviously was that he wanted to, to speak to his crowd. But we also need to apply this to our own lives at this time. And for me, if I read Philippians, um, and I said to read before, and you know, I'm actually enjoying Philippians quite a bit at this at this time. Um, there's some instructions there. There's some. If you look at his heart and the way that he prays, it is such encouraging words that he wants to share with his readers. Um, and I believe that is applicable to our lives as we look. Um, we even in this situation, um, but you know, we we need to to learn from that. Now, just picture this. Uh, in your mind quickly, you know, Paul is sitting in a dungeon, locked up. Now, for most of us, I mean, we're battling just, um, you know, home arrest currently. <laughs> we're sitting at home and um, we're battling just with this thought of not going out and everything. But Paul, yes, Paul, sitting in a dungeon, locked up. And what does he do? Now, uh, most of us probably will have a major pity party or, you know, sit and moan and groan, um, you know, feel very sorry for ourselves, you know, saying, Lord, why are you doing this to me? You know, why am I in this situation, etc. And here we see Paul in uh, probably worse situation than we are currently. Um, and he thinks of the Philippians and he's writing to them. And if you, if you think of his situation, if you think that he's sitting in a jail, you know, there's probably rats and, and moist and it's not a, a nice place. It's dark and everything. And he's thinking about these people. And he writes, can, dare I say, almost this love letter to his, his people. So, like I said, I want to pick up on, on five things. So this is the context to this, the, to this letter. And in verse six, verse six 
um, he, he, reads the, he writes the following, he says, I am convinced that God, who began the good work in you, will carry it through to the completion on the day of Christ Jesus. So after um, you know, celebrating the fact and thinking of them and, and the fact that they are involved in his ministry, he writes that he says, I am convinced that God who began this work in you. Now, this is a very interesting statement because I'm sure this sort of was rooted for me in the fact that you know, he had an encounter with Jesus on, on the road to, to Patmos. And, oh, um, in any case, uh, he had this encounter with Jesus and um, his life was radically transformed. And he saw God even working in his own life and through his ministry, just transforming people. And he, he was writing to them saying that, listen, God started this work and he will complete it. So he's, he's placing the infidence, uh, emphasis on, on the fact that it is God who started the work. Although, you know, through his own life, he was uh, involved in the, their lives and he was ministering to them. He recognizes, uh, or even through personal experience, that, that, that it is God who will take this work further. That he will finish it. That he will uh, uh, take it to the end in Christ. You know, and I think for us, as we, we walk this journey with God, let me encourage you that God who started the good work in you will finish it. Because God is about working in your life, ministering to you, you know, taking you from one place to the next. He's, he's, he wants to see you grow. He wants to see you expand. He wants to see you being transformed and changed. Completely. So this is the first thing that Paul lifts out for me here is the fact that God will um, start this work and he will finish it. So in your walk, in your journey before God, I want to encourage you, do not get discouraged if you think things are growing slow. Trust God to take that which you have started, to let it grow, let it expand in your life, and that it will complete it in Christ Jesus. You know, I think we'll only truly see the full work of God the day we stand before Jesus. Uh, I can certainly, in the, in the number of years that I've been serving the Lord, see how God has transformed my own life. And, I, and I'm so aware of the fact that he's not done. It's not finished. You know, I'm sometimes surprised at the things that God still is, you know, able to pull out of my life and say, Kubis, I need you to work on this or I need you to deal with that, etc. And it's like God is constantly at work in my life to just transform me uh, into the image of Christ. So trust God to take this work, to, to finish it uh, in Christ Jesus, because he's definitely um, at work in that process. And then if we, if we jump ahead a bit and we get to uh, chapter of verse 9 to 11, he, he says the following, he says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What a powerful prayer. You know, a prayer that we can definitely pray for one another consistently. Love the way how he is now. He's speaking to his readers and he's saying, man, I'm praying for you. This is my prayer that I'm praying for you. And what is he praying? He's saying, I pray that your love may abound, that it may grow, you know, that it may become larger. That in, in, in what? In the knowledge, in, 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 with knowledge and all discernment. Wow. Knowledge, obviously, of Christ. Discernment of what is good. You know, like... Um, Paul says, you know, you need to work out our salvation. And he says, listen, I pray that you will grow in love. And if we look at scripture and if we read uh, what Jesus is saying, you know, love plays such a big role in the Christian walk, in walking with God. I mean, it's the fact that God loved us so much that he gave his son to save us. And now he's saying, listen, I, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in discernment. In knowledge. You know, so I pray that, that as we pray this for one another, as we minister to one another, that we will grow in love, that our knowledge even of God and its sermon will grow uh, in Christ Jesus. Why then? Uh, verse 10 says this, 
so that you may approve what is excellent. How will we be able to see, recognize what is excellent? It's when we're growing in love, when our love grows in the knowledge and in the discernment. That is how we will know what is excellent. Uh, and so be pure and blameless before God. So the result of that is, you know, that we will, we will uh, see what is excellent, but then we will also be blameless before Christ Jesus. So he's encouraging his readers here to grow in a specific thing. Why? So that they can stand blameless before God. And watch this in verse 11. He says, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Is that not something that God does so often in our lives where he um, you know, works in our lives for a specific fruit? You know, we, we, we can also uh, bear the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And God is working in, his, uh, in the lives of every Christian to bring forth fruit. So your life, you know, he's saying, listen, grow in love, grow in knowledge, grow in discernment. Why? So that you can bear fruit. So that it doesn't just stay with you, so that that fruit can, can, can come forth. And what happens to fruit? Fruit, if you know, if you think of a, a fruit tree, you know, uh, I've got these, um, what do you call this trees here outside? It's uh, the Wimpies. Yeah, it's a, it's a prune tree. It's a small prune. Can't remember the name. But you know, every year these trees bear their fruit. And um, uh, yeah, last year, I think, was the first year that I actually enjoyed some of the fruit because I don't take care of those trees too much. Well, I started off very well years ago when we moved in here. Uh, pruned them and um, you know got them ready and they start bearing fruit. But it was hard work to try and keep the insects away. But the amazing thing is that tree bears fruit. And every year when I look at it, I, I want to go eat off that fruit. I want to go enjoy it. But if it's not taken care of, you know, it goes to waste. There's a lot of that fruit that actually goes to waste. And the, the point that I'm wanting to make here is that tree bears that fruit. Uh, simply because it's who it is. And, and if we are in Christ, if we are growing in love, if we are abounding, our love is abounding more and more, if we are growing in discernment, if we are growing to, to, to understand what the, the excellent things are, then that fruit will come forth and that fruit will bless those people around you. And if you allow God just to tend to you, if you allow, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, your fruit will be good. Yeah? And then your fruits of righteousness will go forth and it will bless those that are around you. And if you see that picture, if you, you see what Paul is writing to his people, are saying, listen, I want you to grow so that you can bear fruit, so that you can be a blessing to those that are around you, that that righteousness can go forth in Christ Jesus. Huh? Why? To the glory of God. So our fruit that we're bearing is not for ourselves or to draw attention to us, but it is to the glory of God of God. Great to see how Paul just encourages them to live this life, to walk before God, so that why? So that the nations around them will be transformed. You know, almost like he's saying, listen, thank you for, for investing in my missional uh, uh, ministry here, but I want you through your lifestyle to become missional as well. Such a powerful statement. Then, if we jump ahead again to, to verse 12, Philippians 1, he says, and I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to the advance of the gospel, so that he has become known throughout the whole imperial God and to all the rest of my, uh, that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, again, let's just take it back. You know, he's sitting in jail. It's not looking good. And here he writes, listen, I just want you to know that my current circumstances has been transformed by God so much that it has become known to the whole imperial God that I'm actually here for Christ. Wow. He's sitting in the dungeon. He's sitting in jail. It's not a good situation. It's terrible. But in that situation, he gives glory to God in such a way that it's becoming known to everybody around him that is there for Jesus Christ. His situation was terrible, yet the result was not. It was transforming and changing those that are around him. 
And then sometimes, you know, I guess the question then is for us, is what happens when we grow through a challenging time? What happens when, you know, what will be the result of this isolation to those around us for the gospel's sake? And I love how he says this, you know, that it has become uh, known throughout the whole imperial God and to all the rest. So it's not just those that are standing God over them, watching them, going, you know, oh, wow, we can see he's, you know, praying, etc. The The impact of his life in that jail was of such that it, it impacted the whole imperial God as well as all of the rest. What a powerful thought to think that, you know, Paul, you're sitting in this jail and it's affecting everybody around you. It just makes me think, you know, how do I handle the situations, the trials, the things that I face? What is the result of that? Does those around me see the gospel? Do they see the fact that even when I'm going through persecution or hardship, that it is to the glory of God? That even in that situations, I'm growing in my love. And the just interesting thing about this, this portion of scripture, uh, verse 12 to 18, he says here uh, in verse, let's read verse 14. He said, most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my change, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So, so because of his change, now those around him is actually becoming bold to preach. And then he continues in verse 15. He said, so, in, so some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. <laughs> How's that? And some also from goodwill. So it blows my mind. So he is in jail. You know, his life is a testimony to those, to those around him, actually causing those around him to start preaching the gospel. Some out of envy and strife, but, but they are preaching the gospel. And if you read further, um, verse 16 and so on, he says, man, it doesn't matter that they're preaching out of envy. You know, there's other crowd that actually preaches it out of love because they've got a revelation of what God is doing. But these guys are preaching it out of envy. And that's okay because the gospel is being preached. But what blows my mind is that, you know, he's, he's sitting in this terrible situation. He's, his walk with Christ becomes evident to those around him in such a way that they actually start preaching the gospel. May that be the fruit on your life and my life that, that as we walk before God, as we go through life, that it will touch people in such a way that they will preach the gospel. Do you understand the, the powerful thing that is actually happening here? That the Spirit of the Lord is moving in such a way that it is inspiring people to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to those around them. I mean, again, it just, it just blows my mind to think that, wow. You know, I almost want to say, I would have loved to just be there to see how Paul lived in that situation, that that would be the result. Because if we just think humanly and generally in our lives, when people grow, go through a tough time, that is rarely the result that people, they, that their lives are not transformed like that. And may God move on your life and my life in such a way that as we go through the trials and the things in our lives, that that it will inspire people actually to preach the gospel. Come on. Wow. Yes, Lord, please, let that be the result of your presence on my life. In any case, right, so verse 19 to 26, if we can look at that quickly. Um, he, he says this one thing, starting off in verse 19. He says this, I'm confident in the, that he's confident in their prayers and that he's expecting God to do this. This is not on the slide, but, but he just says this, a sort of an introduction to what is following. He says this, man, I'm so confident in your prayers, in the way that you are praying for me, that, that I know the Spirit of God will answer. May we pray for one another in such a way that we will have such comfort in these situations that, that God will move on our behalf. And then he says this. He, he, he actually makes this declaration. I, I love this. Um, let me just see if I can, can find it here quickly and then we can read it for you. Um, in verse 20, in verse 20 he says this. Let me get my Bible this way. Says, 
according to my earnest expectation, so he makes it clear, this is his expectation, this is what he's expecting, um, and hope that in, in nothing I shall be ashamed. Okay? But with all boldness always, so know also Christ will magnify, uh, will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. So he's saying, listen, my eager expectation is the following. Firstly, that I will not be ashamed. That it doesn't matter what situation I find myself in, that I will not be ashamed. But that I will have the courage to preach the gospel. Why? That Christ will be honored. And then he says this, in my body, in life and death. Wow. Such an expectation, such a clear goal of his life. I mean, if you think of being sold out for God, then this is the kind of declaration that I guess, guess should be our life's declaration, is that we will not be ashamed, that we will have courage to preach the gospel no matter what, that Christ will be honored in everything that we do, and that that will happen in our bodies. So it's not just like he's saying, oh, you know, I will pray 24-7 and that's all I'll do. He says, I'll live this life. My expectation is to live this life that Christ will be honored. And that I will have courage, that I will be fearless, that I will do this because I'm sold out for Jesus Christ. And then verse 21 um, is basically of chapter 1 or definitely of the book, the main theme of this and, and, and to, I mean if you if you look at this you can see sold out. He is absolutely sold out. In verse 21 he says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is Cain. Oh, that is such a powerful, absolute statement. For me to live is Christ and to die is Cain. A sold out life. In 22, he says, if I am to live in the flesh, um, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which shall I choose? I cannot tell. So what is Paul is saying here is that, listen, I am completely sold out for Christ. For me to live, it's only for one purpose, is for Jesus Christ. If I die, I see this as gain. Because then I am with Christ. And then in the following verses, he, he, he sort of makes clear, or he, he speaks about this, this um, uh, battle he's having in his mind, you know, possibly sitting in, in imprisonment, uh, you know, facing maybe uh, execution. Uh, uh, you know, he's, he's going, oh, you know, for me to die as gain, I, I want to be with Jesus. I just want to, I, I want to be with him. And then on the other side, he goes like, but if I stay here, it will be for your benefit. And that's what it's saying in the, in the verses that follows there is that, listen, if I stay, it will be for your benefit. Then I can teach you. Then I can instruct you. Then I can be here with you. I can walk with you. We can pray together. We can journey this life together. So I'm battling with this thought, you know, do I, I really want to be with Jesus, but I want to be here with you. And then, and, and then it says that challenged me so much. He's thinking just to think, you know, how much do I desire to be with Christ on the one hand? You know, that single-mindedness, that focus for Christ saying, listen, I'm so sorry, I just want to be with you, Jesus. And on the other side, he's going, but I just want to shepherd these people. I just want to be there for them. Because I know my job is not uh, finished yet. And for me, that is the challenge, you know, that, that I personally take out of this. is just a quiver, you know. How is your heart towards Christ? But how is your heart towards the people? And, and you can see as in his writing that he's just battling with his thought. I oh, man, I want to be with Jesus. I actually don't want to be here, but I have to be here. And I want to be here too. Ah, which way am I going to choose? I want to be with Jesus. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to each one of us and you know, that we will become so hungry for God, but we will also understand that which he is calling us to do. The single-mindedness of his thinking there is just so incredible. You know, there's so much that Paul can do, but in that moment, his heart and his thought is, how can I be there for you? How can I minister to you? 
And then verse 27, he says this, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Now, he sort of draws the line in the sand. He's saying, listen, you can do anything, but let your life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whether I come and see you or, an, or I'm absent, uh, I hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Wow. So he's saying, listen, firstly, let your life be worthy of the, of the gospel. Live a life that brings glory to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let your life be a testimony to those around you. You know, let your life be worthy of it. And then he goes on and he recognizes, listen, it's not just about you. It's not just about your life. It's about those around you. And he says, with one mind, with one mind, focused on what Christ wants to do. Striving side by side for the gospel. So he's saying, listen, you know, let your life count for the gospel. It's just thinking quickly, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a rugby team. You know, can you be the best, uh, what do you call it, prop, for instance, that you can be? But take those around you because it's as you as a team are the best that you can be and what God is calling you to be, you will have the victory. That's sort of the, the picture that springs up in my mind is that, listen, be of one mind. Get the same goal, work towards the same vision, you know, have the same heart for the gospel, pursue what Christ is calling you to pursue uh, as one. And then do this side by side. Do not do this alone. Do not, you know, uh, try and be your own man. Uh, but take those that are around you uh, to, to fulfill what God is calling you to. We cannot do this on our own, is, is what he's saying here. And it doesn't matter how you serve God, how you walk with God, it is not about you alone, it's about you and those around you. You know, we, we know are full aware of this that you know if the enemy wants to to, to, to to sow destruction in the church, he just has to get us not to be of the same mind. If he brings division, division, if he brings in two visions, he will he has split many churches, he's destroyed many ministries, he's he's broken many relationships. Because we were not in one mind. And this is Paul's prayer for the church here. Is listen, I want you to be of one mind. I want you to strive side by side. And then he encourages them. He says, listen, do not be scared of anything. Do not be scared. As you move forward, do not be scared of anything. But let it, as you move, let it be a sign to those around you of the gospel. For some it will be a sign to destruction, but to others it will be a sign of salvation. Now, so as we move, we recognize that some people will look at, at this, this oneness as we move in love, you know, a life worthy for the gospel, and that, and that will lead them to destruction because they will reject the good news of the gospel. But to others, it will be salvation. It will mean freedom. And that he's saying, listen, do not be scared of what you're going to face. As you move out, do not draw back, but, but go with boldness as you move to, with one another. You know, and the amazing thing is, and I'm sure that this will happen, is that, you know, as they move forward, they will encourage one another in faith. And the different gifts and, and abilities will kick in in the body as they move forward to bring the gospel to those people, to the people around them. And yes, for some, they will reject it. And we must always remember that is people's choice. To reject or accept the gospel. So some there will be salvation. Um, so it's not just your faith that testifies, but your suffering for Christ too is the last point that he makes in that portion of scripture. He says, Listen, if you suffer, suffer well. <laughs> Come on. I mean, he's writing this from jail, so I think he's got the upper hand here. He's like, <laughs> if you're gonna suffer, do this good. Look, my life is a testament. The whole imperial God and everybody else is knowing what is happening here. Let your life be a testimony to them. So as Paul writes to these people, he's encouraging them. And I mean, there's a lot more. And, and I think my one tension in preparing uh, 
the sermon today because I want to do it in four Sundays. Is there so much actually in this book that you can still draw from? So I want to encourage you just to, to read it. But he has these five things that he's communicating to his hearers, and I want to close with this. There's five things he says, listen, firstly, understand that the work that God has started in you, he will complete it. Yes, you also, Paul writes and he says, work out your own salvation. You know, pursue God in such a manner that you, you, you can work your salvation out with him. But yes, he says, listen, allow God to fulfill the work or complete the work that he has started in you. Just focus on him. He says, that you may grow in your love, that your love may grow in knowledge and in discernment, that it will lead to a place where it will bring all glory and honor to God. It's to grow in your love. And I think that should our pray, be our praise that we will grow each in our, in our love and in our knowledge and discernment. The third thing is uh, the things which has happened will be even for them for Christ. So he's, he's, he's again just saying, listen, doesn't matter what happens to you, let it be to the glory of God. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Doesn't matter what you face. And allow God to use it for his glory. And then to love, uh, uh, you know, live a, a sold out life for Christ. And I think no one can accuse Paul of not doing that. Not being sold out for him. Live a life sold out. To live is Christ. To die is gain. He says, listen, live a sold out life for Christ. And then the last point that he makes is to do this together as one in one mind. And then I'm, I'm confident as we apply these things, as we allow the Spirit of God to do this in our lives, that we will move as one. That God will accomplish the things that he is able to do uh, through us and in us. So just that last statement is sold out towards the world. In other words, my life for the world says sold out. I've got nothing left. You can get nothing from me anymore. Devil, I'm sold out. And I'm all in for Christ. I've got nothing left for you anymore. The world, I've got nothing to give to you. It's incredible if you think of that, if we live like that, a sold out life for God, what will the world see? But let that be our life's testimony. Let the glory of God be in such a way in us that the world will see that we are sold out for the world. Is your life sold out for Christ? Well, sold out towards the world, but I mean, in, is it sold out that you sold out for him alone that he gets everything there's nothing left for the world anymore i think that's a journey that each one of us has to face am i sold out for him one of the things like i said is the joy of christ you know it's this thing that uh, in the book paul says listen uh, doesn't matter what you uh, go through it's it's not about getting what you want but it's actually it's living this life that is fully sold out for him. Doesn't matter our circumstances, doesn't matter what we face. You know, my life is completely sold out to him. So I trust that this this encourages you, maybe, you know, um, challenges you in, in some ways to to evaluate where you are in your walk with God and even to look at Paul's life. And you know, even if you read his other uh, books, there's so many times that we can just see his complete sold out relationship with Christ and may God work that even in our own hearts during this time that we will be completely for Jesus in everything that we do so we want to take some time um, to, 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 to minister and, and just to pray for one another you know in your homes and so on again and I just I want to encourage you maybe the thing that stood out for you just share that with with those around you and say okay listen this is the one thing that I believe God is just placing in my heart or stirring in my heart at the moment. Well, this is the question that I have. And just take a moment to minister to one another. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for Paul's life, for the testimony of his life, God. Even um, showing in a similar way as Jesus, how it is possible to live completely and fully 
uh, sold out for you, Father God. A life that glorifies your life that doesn't matter what he faces, Father God, his life is just a, a testimony of um, being so focused on you. And Lord, I pray for us, your church, at this time, that we will have this hard attitude. Lord, you will come and you will work in our hearts that we will be completely focused just on you. Doesn't matter what we face, doesn't matter the hardships, doesn't matter the issues that we have, Lord God, but that we will be completely focused on you. And we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Father, for the encouragement. Thank you, Lord, that you started the work and you will finish it. I pray that we will grow in love, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you will work so deeply in our hearts, Father God, that, that the love will just pour out from us and be a blessing to those around you, God. Lord, let our lives be lives that are to live as Christ and to die as Christ. Father, we want to be a testimony to your name in that way. The Holy Spirit, work deeply in our hearts, we pray this morning. Have your way in us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you as you spend some time um, in the presence of the Lord with you.